a snap. This is a snapshot of Jerry Laybourne from the documentary of her team that really took Nickelodeon uh, to to international heights from almost nothing under her leadership. Now, um, this is another photograph from the same documentary. <laughs> Before I give a formal introduction of Jerry Laybourne, uh, I'll ask her to explain the transition from this photograph to that one. Jerry? I, I'm not seeing a transition. Are you seeing it on your I your didn't see side? it either. No. Oh. Oh, okay. Stop. Sorry, sorry. You saw the first one, right? Yes. Okay. This is the second one. <laughs> now, I know the first question you're going to ask is, what did that feel like? It feels fantastic. It's warm. It's just the greatest thing. If you ever get a chance to get slimed, raise your hand and say yes. Um, on Nickelodeon, our, one of our first successful shows was called You Can't Do That on Television. And we did not want to have spoiled brat kids on TV. So these kids were from Ottawa, Canada, and they were just regular kids, although one of them turned out to be Alanis Morissette. I don't know if you know that singer, but uh, she became a popular singer. And when they started to act kind of sassy, we figured out we should slime them and that would make them be more grounded. And uh, it, it didn't really work because it's so fun to be slimed that they were just so eager to be slimed and we paid them an extra $50. But would anybody like the recipe? <laughs> I think we have some people who do want the recipe. Okay, well, no one knows this recipe, so be careful, oh. don't, don't spread it around. It's cream of wheat. Do you have cream of wheat in India? It's just a very plain grain, like a breakfast cereal. Green food coloring, baby shampoo, and lots of oil and warm, warm water. So now you have it. Anyway, that's not the most important thing about Nickelodeon, but- Well, let me, let me uh, okay. set you up a little bit better. I just okay. want to show those pictures because it shows uh, two sides of, of Jerry Laybourne that have made her an incredible leader and those two sides, of course, she has many more than two sides, as we all do. But one is, she is a consummate professional and industry leader, thinker, intellectual. The other is, she understands the importance of respecting children, never talking down to children, letting children be children, which is what that documentary is all about. It may seem obvious, but it clearly wasn't obvious at the time that there could be a successful channel for children by children, which enabled children to break the rules, to cross boundaries uh, to be who they want to be. That's the playful side 
uh, of Jerry. I think we all have a little child in us. I know I do. Uh, Jerry certainly does. And I think it's an extraordinary combination uh, for somebody to have this high-powered, highly successful career at the very top and still be so in tune with children. Now, she actually came up from an entry-level position at Nickelodeon, which had only been a year old when she joined. And then she worked her way up to being CEO, president. And under her leadership, Nickelodeon became the top-rated 24-hour cable programming service, won Emmy Awards, Peabody Awards, Cable ACE Awards, Parents' Choice Awards. She then became president of Disney ABC Cable Networks. She partnered with Oprah Winfrey and others to create Oxygen Media, a cable TV company dedicated to creating television and internet programming for women. Oxygen had 270,000 primetime weekday viewers in 74 million homes. Jerry is a, an extraordinary role model for young people who want to overcome challenges in, in her case, being in, at that time, a cutthroat man's world and getting to the very top, while also remaining a mentor. She has been a mentor to many people, and uh, I know she'll be a mentor to some of you, our students at Sci University. So thank you, Jerry. And uh, it's, take it away. Do whatever you want uh, with this session. And if I feel like uh, interjecting, of course I will. But I think uh, it's going to be a very, uh, very informal, really inspiring one. Thank you. Thank you, Jamshed. Uh, one thing that Jamshed didn't mention was that we share the bond of Vassar College. And um, we both have served on the board of trustees there. But I just have to say that when I went to Vassar, I didn't really know what I was gonna do. I got very interested in architecture and planning and, but Vassar taught me to question everything. So when I, um, started at Nickelodeon, I brought that characteristic. And I got into media because I met my husband, which is the f one of the, besides going to Vassar, probably the next important decision, well, maybe more important decision. But he, he's an artist, he's a producer, he's a writer. He um, is 78. And he's uh, writing curriculum right now to teach at Vassar's Lifelong Learning. And the program is called iFogi. And it's how to use your iPhone to make things, make movies and animation. And I think, you know, I, I hope all of you are still making things when you're 78, um, which is very long way away for you. So I met my husband and he was working in Philadelphia, teaching kids in inner city who had no advantages whatsoever. They had, they couldn't read or write. They were in high school and he taught them how to make movies. And once they got interested in making movies, they learned to read and write. They had to learn to read and write, but it was something that was really engaging. And so I followed him into education and into media, and 
uh, found my way to Nickelodeon. And because I was more concerned about kids than I was about television, I was just so concerned that everything we do for kids would be good for them. And anytime any producer came with a show idea, uh, I would just say, what does this do for kids? And if they couldn't come up with an answer, we didn't do the show. And um, I also had two kids at the time. And when I, when I first joined the staff of Nickelodeon, it was so brand new. And it was the only, they only had one show. It was called Pinwheel and it was for little kids. My son was five. He went off to camp and he came home. He had a Nickelodeon hat on and he came home and he threw the hat in the closet and he was crying. I said, what is the matter, Sam? He said, those kids said that Nickelodeon is a, is a baby channel. And then I heard him, somebody asked him, what does your mother do? And he said, she's a housewife. So my goal became, how do I make Nickelodeon something that Sam would find cool enough and be proud of. And our kids were involved in everything. They had to see every show. Some weekends they would just sob, please mommy, no more TV, let us go outside, please mom. And um, nobody thinks that's funny. Come on, <laughs> a couple smiles. <laughs> no, no. That, uh, I, have, I noticed this, is this cultural because I no, noticed the, the women are smiling and the men are not smiling. <laughs> what? I have to ask. Kaving? Kaven? Why? Why no smile? It's not so funny. You're still muted. Oops. Kevin, you're still muted. Okay. Um, about Taryn. Karim? Okay. Uh oh, now we lost him completely. <laughs> okay, well, never mind. I'm not. Oh, here you are. There, you came over here. Okay. okay just, He's... Now I see a smile. You don't have to explain. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, it was a big adventure. And I would say, one of the important things that my husband taught me, so I was a middle child. Anybody here a middle child? Raise your hand if you're a middle child. Not so many middle children. Well, I was sandwiched in between two powerful sisters and my husband just brought sunlight onto my head and he is a very playful guy. And when I was a little kid, my hobbies were things like writing away to foreign embassies and reading the brochures and filing them in alphabetical order and, you know, collecting straw wrappers and really just crazy, nerdy, nerdy things. And I met this guy, Kit Laybourne, so fun. And I, I realized that, and this is a, a quote from somebody uh, I think her name is Diane Harrison. Play is the brain's favorite way of learning. And this is what I believe through and through. And you'll see it throughout my career because whether you're brainstorming with a group of people or you're welcoming uh, customers, being playful helps everybody relax and everybody think. And what you really want to do in any meeting that you're in is get people thinking. You, I'm not a top-down manager, and I'm sure you guys know there's two basic philosophies, team management and command and control management. And command and control is where the CEO is expected to have all the answers they sit at the head of the table, they dole out the problems. And of course, the CEO is always the person who has the least amount of information on any one issue because they have su such a wide purview. 
So I was an early adopter of what seems like the most logical way to manage team management. And we did, we had coaches and we took it seriously. I mean, John said's right. I am deadly serious about play <laughs> and kids and my audience. And actually my favorite uh, piece of data was when I left Nickelodeon, we did a survey with kids. And one of the questions was, does Nickelodeon understand you? And 96% of the kids said Nickelodeon understands me. And I joked that the other 4% didn't understand the question, but um, you know, that was what was important. We wanted to be like Mr. Rogers. We like you just the way you are. We want to play with you. We want to engage you. We want to get you out of your chair. We did this crazy show, Double Dare. Has anybody ever seen Double Dare? Has anybody ever seen Nickelodeon? Okay, maybe you could tell me some shows you've seen on Nickelodeon. Did anybody see Double Dare? I saw more to Patlu, ma'am, in Nickelodeon. I'm sorry. Who, like uh, is this Nandita? Oh, yes, ma'am. Who's speaking? I, no, Roshni. 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 I'm not seeing Roshmi. She's in a blue shirt. Teal color blue shirt. Yeah. No? Okay. Well, keep going. Oh, I see. I have two pages. Sorry. Um, okay. Keep talking. I still can't see you. Oh, but... okay, ma'am. I like in Nickelodeon Motu Patlu Rudra. I will see, ma'am. These are Indian shows, Jerry. Motu Patlu yes. uh, yes, yes, sir. I am Indian. Yes. I like that shows very much, ma'am. In my family, all are seeing. That's great. Did you see Rugrats? Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. And Doug? No, ma'am. I don't see that no? one. Okay. Well, Double Dare is a crazy show where we we created it was also important to us that girls and boys could win shows not just boys and uh not just girls so we created this show that had trivia questions physical challenges and an obstacle course and the obstacle course you had to run through these crazy things. And I had to do it one day. I had to swim through a vat of French toast. French toast is made of bread, eggs, milk, and vanilla. That was disgusting. And you'd have to raise, you'd have to put your hand up through a giant nostril and pull a flag out and, or a bag of feathers or these crazy things. And, um, Anyway, it became very, very popular in the United States. And we tapped into something that would get kids competing in a really fun way. So in, in the early days of Nickelodeon, the only alternatives they had was watching adult TV or Saturday morning cartoons that were uh, cheaply produced and just a lot of, they, they had a lot of crazy philosophies like um, just make it noisy. It doesn't matter what the writing is. And, you know, our writers for Nickelodeon are, have gone on to be really famous TV writers. We took it seriously. So Double Dare put us on the map of hit successes. And I just, I want to, deviate from the creative for a second. My gift at in business was that I was cre as creative on the business side as I was on the idea side. So we had this big success. Our, our company Viacom wanted to have um, Bruce Jenner, who was an Olympian, host an adult version of Double Dare. And they were going to ruin our franchise because it was very uh, sexy, uh, 
you know, little costumes for people. And it was just gross. And so I went to the head of the company. I went first, I went to an outside distributor and I said, how much would you give me to syndicate Double Dare? Five million dollars. OK, that was a lot of money in those days. So I went to the president of our company and I said, I have an outside order to syndicate kids double dare. I, you will ruin our franchise if you do this cr cruddy, cheap, cheesy uh, adult version. And he said, OK. And I said, but that's the wrong answer for you to say. You should have our company syndicated for kids. And so that's what happened. And I got $5 million into the account of Nickelodeon. And I made him promise that he wouldn't tax it. Like when you're in a big corporation, you have to make a contribution at, to corporate and to every other division. And so let's say we made $100 million on Double Dare, we would have gotten something like, you know, maybe 5 million. But I was able to hold that whole 5 million and to invest it into doing animation. So um, I consider the fact of helping us leap into a more expensive form was due to creativity and, um, and sticking sticking to the promise to kids we weren't going to let um we weren't going to let adults mess with what we were doing and i mean there were plenty of adults working with me although i was 35 when i became president of nickelodeon and my staff was probably younger than most of you so i was the only one with kids my my team was so young and fresh and they didn't know the rules of TV, which is why we did so well. Nobody ever said, um, oh, you can't do that. No, we can try anything. And we tried a lot of things. We did little experiments. We I had a fund that was called the Creative Lab and uh, anybody at Nickelodeon could come to that lab and say, I want to try this. And they could get their idea made into a one minute promo or something like that. How many of you think you're going to go into a creative field? Rish Rashita, Sri Preya, Sarang, uh, Duk Shaji, Duk Shaji? Dak Shaji. Dak Shaji. Dak Shijama. Dak Shijama. Um, so, oh, Rashini. Dak Shijama. So, yes. Rashina. Rashina. Um, I, it's hard for me. It's so early in the morning, you guys. Be, be understanding. I do want to know you. And, um, and I see your face. The ones who let me see their faces are... I see you and, I, and I'm so grateful. Thank you. Um, so we, we did something radical. We had this fund and um, we went, we hired a woman who was a very gifted uh, storyteller to go around the country and to find creators who had characters living inside them. Have you guys ever seen the Muppets or Sesame Street? So Jim Henson was the creator of all those Muppets. And he had Kermit the Frog living inside him. He always played Kermit the Frog. And that's what we were looking for. People who had characters that were had many dimensions to them and that really would uh, sing out. A lot of animation in those days were flat, you know, noisy, not very important. And there was a theory that you should only, for kids TV, you should only do properties that were already made. So you should make 
make TV out of film. You should make TV out of toys. You should make TV out of books. And we did, we just at almost at every turn, we figured out what the rules of the kids industry were. And we went the other direction and that's called being disruptive. We figured if everybody else is going this way, we're going that way. And you can make such a big impact if you are disruptive. And I'm a second child, so I have nothing but disruption in me. That is what I want to do at all times. So we commissioned three eight-minute pilots with that $5 million. And we got Rugrats, Doug, Ben and Stimpy. They were all instant hits. And it paved the way for uh, probably you've seen SpongeBob and, uh, uh, you know, just so many uh, Rocco's Modern Life, just a ton of animation. But the secret to it was behind every bit of animation was somebody who had their own vision. And we as a network were not going to mess with it. And you know, I had so many theories about network television. And when I was at Disney and ABC, all my theories were right. All they, the way that they governed their decisions was looking over their shoulder to see what is CBS doing? What is NBC doing? We have to get that pilot because we don't want NBC to get it. And that kind of mentality means you're just following, you're just following and, and you're motivated by fear. Our rule was kids are gonna decide what goes on this network. So we never put anything on the network without either having one-on-one -on -one research with kids or if it was a comedy, we had to do one-on-one -on -one because comedy is very personal but we would get groups of kids together. Even when we had no money, we would partner with adjacent schools and bring things in and get kids feedback. And, you know, staying close, whatever you guys do, staying close to the customer is your number one job. Whether it's, you know, why did we succeed? With Nickelodeon, we had 56% of all kid TV viewing when I left. We were, as John said, said, the most profitable cable network. We were the most watched cable network, not just kids networks, all cable networks. And our shows were the highest rated shows. It wasn't because we went to tried and true talent. None of our talent, none of our producers were big network producers. They were all young, um, energetic, dedicated to what they're doing. So let me take a break and see how you guys are doing. Do you, do you want to know more about business? Hi, Rashita. Rashita. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Hello, ma'am. I am super, super excited right now while talking to you. Um, I'm a huge, huge fan of Nickelodeon since I was a child. And also my father, he works in the Walt Disney Company. So these oh. channels, Nickelodeon, Disney, they're all very close to my heart. And uh, right now when I'm talking to you, I have goosebumps because <laughs> I see your reflection in the future, Rishita. I want to be like you five years down the line. I just see how you are right now. I think I'm a little bit fast paced, but uh, it's like um, I want to build my own startup, which eventually grows into a big MNC like Nickelodeon. And I am just longing to connect with you, associate with you in any possible way, understand how this industry works, how the market works, and I can be as disruptive as you want me to. 
<laughs> and learn a lot, lot, lot from you. Well, Jamshed can connect you to me. Um, let me just say a little bit. Thank you so much. That was really lovely. Um, so this applies to everybody, men and women on the call. When I entered business, there were books being written about how women should behave. And we were just coming into the workforce. So they told us only wear navy blue because navy blue is a sincere color. Wear a bow tie, talk sports. This is how you should talk. This is how you should do. This is all of this stuff. And I couldn't stop laughing. It's like, if I have to act like a man, I am going to be a terrible man. I don't know the first thing about being a man. My best shot is being Geraldine Laybourne. If I can be 100% Geraldine Laybourne, nobody in the world can do a better job of that than me. And so early on, I had a boss who invited, I was put on the executive committee of MTV Networks. That was our parent company. And there were three men and me. And the night before I go into the meeting, I'm so nervous. I go to my husband and say, you have to quiz me about sports. I don't know how to talk sports. So we spent three hours, him quizzing me. And, I, and I'm so nervous going into this executive room. Remember, I'm I was probably 34 at the time. I wasn't yet president and I was scared. I didn't know which way does the door go? You know, what do I, how am I going to act? I had no role models. I was this most senior woman. And I go in and on the first topic, I massacre a sports analogy. I think I'm talking about basketball, but I'm talking about tennis. And I and my boss looks at me and he said, Jerry, we have you here for you to be you. You know nothing about sports and we never talk about sports because I also don't know anything about sports. And we and he he was, you know, the inventor of MTV and he definitely spent all his time on MTV, but with me, he gave me so much uh, courage. And he, there were people in the company that could not stand having a woman in the place I was in and tried to belittle me and they would use coarse language around me. And I would just play with that. I would just say, now, is that a good thing? Why would you say something like that? And I had everybody howling because I, my boss had my back and he would never let any, any of these guys near me, never let them shape what we were doing. And uh, so my message to all of you, the men who worked for me loved working for me because they didn't have to conform to any kind of corporate uh, mandates for men. Men get, I'm not sure this is true now, Dom said, but men get pressured in a different way than women to be like each other. In our company, our first president was a guy who smoked a cigar. So all the guys smoked cigars. Thank God I didn't have to smoke cigars. But I did get a big quilt that was made of cigars and I hung it in my office just to make, you know, I don't think anybody ever got the joke, but I did. The next one wore Armani suits. So all the guys wore Armani suits. The next one divorced his wife. So all the guys divorced their wives. I'm not kidding. I am not kidding. And so my, what started out with me trying to help women be heard because what would happen as we got other women into the executive team, I would sit the woman down. I'd say, Sarah, here's what's going to happen. You're going to come into the room. 
you're going to say something and nobody's going to listen and they're not going to say anything. And I'm going to try to repeat what you said and they may not listen to me. But as soon as somebody says your idea, I'm going to say thank you for supporting Sarah's idea. Sure enough, that happened. But then I realized there were alpha men in the group and then there were men that were close to the problem, the men that we needed to hear from. And so my mantra was make sure the people who know what they're talking about get hurt, whether they're men or women. And I think that's just a great practice for all of you, whatever you do. If you start listening to others and they're not listened to by others, help them. And, you know, for me, my practice with women, um, I, I, anytime a woman got promoted, we would celebrate that. And I would, I would invite any woman who got made a cable network president, I would invite her to lunch and I would give her all the guidance I could and my phone number and permission to call me at any time of the day or night. And we, we supported each other. And when I left the cable industry, there were 20 women heads of cable networks. Now there's one because it's, uh, we've slid back. So I'm just saying, I think eventually gender will be irrelevant, but what I'm saying is not ever gonna be irrelevant. Being yourself and giving other people permission to be themselves and to get a kick out of it. You know, I got 74 million homes with oxygen, not because cable operators wanted one more channel, but because I loved them. I, I got a kick out of them. They were not programmers. They were straight businessmen, but incredibly courageous. And I took the time to get to know them. So when I had my own network, they gave me their customers. And nobody else was able to do that because relationships, I don't know if this is true in India, but it's certainly true here that people just plain like to do business with people they like. And one of the hard things for young women is to uh, embrace that idea. The two things for young women that they have to concentrate is, uh, I call this free love, which is a kind of controversial thing to say, but it's much better to go into the world trying to find what you can like about somebody and talk about it, just, you know, marvel at it. And um, the other thing is you have to stand up to bullies and that applies to everybody. Bullies do not like people who let them be bullied and they only, they only respect you if you stand up to them. And I usually stood up to bullies with my sense of humor and um, that was helpful, um, but they quickly knew they couldn't mess with me. And I don't know if that, if this still exists, you guys, I don't know, but um, don't, don't, don't stand by when you see somebody bully another person. You know, you can ask basic questions is what, what result do you hope to get from this? Because they don't know. They just want to protect themselves. Okay, that's a, that's a downer. Let's, let's get a question that gets us up. Has anybody ever been bullied? Nobody has ever been bullied. Never. Oh my God. I hate to be the one to tell you, you will be bullied at some point in your life. <laughs> I hope not. Maybe it's just Americans bully. No, 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 Jerry, it, I don't know, it may be just uh, the word translation. I don't know if people are interpreting it to mean physical bullying, but also, well, you know, it's uh, people insulting you or um, telling you your idea is stupid or, um, 
yelling at you? No, ma'am. I never let anyone bully me. Good. Not at all. Good. Anybody else? Uh, I think um, bullying is human nature. Like it's something. I think it should like from what I've understood of it, it's something that will be there in every society in every uh, type of community because it's human nature to feel superior and want to make someone else feel inferior. But, like it's just part of. I think rightly or wrongly, it's part of all of us. I think. Yeah. How do you feel about that? others do you feel better when somebody does worse than you uh, ma'am i couldn't hear the last part of the question do you feel better when somebody does worse than you i i personally think it's a gender issue um for instance my husband and i play uh, scrabble or bridge every night and I really don't care if I win I want to do my best my husband is depressed if he doesn't beat me and I I just I, I honestly if all of you were supremely successful in what you do I would be dancing a jig I don't want Swami Natha. How am I saying your name right? Swami Natha? Yes, ma'am. I don't want him to bury you, Sarang. I want you both to join forces and help Sri Preya start her business. You know, I, I believe that what is most underrated in this country is kindness. And I, uh, in, in the world, sorry, you're not in this country. You should be glad because we are not very nice in America these days. But um, kindness, niceness, when you see the orange years, you're going to see a team of people who lived by the, one of the people on the team said this sentence, if we are not looking over our shoulder to make sure that everybody else is getting an A, we will not succeed. And so that's what my team did. If Jeffrey Darby was having a rough time with a show, Debbie BC would go into his office, close the door, and they would unpack it and come out with something that would be helpful. That is not the common practice in business. The common practice in business often is pitting two people against each other. And they think that that's the way to motivate people. I don't, I don't subscribe to that. And I subscribe to diverse groups of people. There was a study at Harvard where they gave, they took people of average intelligence, but mixed race, mixed, mixed gender, mixed religion, mixed everything. And they put eight people in a room and they put eight of the most genius people in the world, white men, these most genius men, gave them the same problem. And guess who came out with the better solution? The average intelligence mixed group. So when you, whatever you're doing, if you're only listening to people who are just like you, you will not go too far. I don't know why I'm so, so let's ask some fun questions. Jamshed, help me. I'm sure. being too serious. No, it's not. Actually, the, the issue that is being discussed about whether, you know, the, the, some people actually enjoy seeing others succeed and on the other end of the, of the continuum, uh, they, they resent it, you know, if, if others do as well as they do or, or better. Now, I'm not talking about when there's a competition, you know, if you're competing for the same trophy or the same, same job, it's a different matter. But we're talking about people who aren't actually competing for the same thing. Some people 
are happy to see others succeed and some resent it. And there is a, I'm speaking as a uh, psychologist, there's a really stunning set of studies uh, done that has implications for obviously psychology, but economics, business, which is that people were uh, given the following choice. So I, if you're a participant in the study, I say, Jerry, uh, I'm going to give you two scenarios. You get to choose. Okay? And there's this other person in the room okay, who you don't know. Scenario one, I'm going to give you six dollars and I'm going to give that other person ten dollars. In scenario two, I'm going to e give each of you five dollars, the same amount. Which do you think most subjects in this experiment chose? They chose B. They would rather the other person not get more than them than get more themselves. So in other words, let me say it again. The first scenario, yeah. you Jerry, get six. In the second scenario, you get only five. But in the first scenario, the other person gets 10. And in the second scenario, they get five, same as you. So a majority of people will take a little bit less just to keep the others down. I mean, it's a shocking result, but it has huge implications for uh, economic theory and it's a whole new field called behavioral economics which looks at the psychological basis of economic behavior. It used to be thought uh, that as long as you maximize your own economic return you don't care whether others are doing better than you or not. But that turns out not to be true. Now there is also evidence that education can change that. Absolutely. Uh, empathy, concern for others, consideration for others, looking at the common good uh, uh, can be developed and, and that's certainly something that schools have to take into account, parents have to take into account and certainly at Thai University we would. Well that is a great segue to what I'm doing now. Can I take that leap? Because I, I, you know, my through line is that I want to um, leave this planet better for kids. And so I'm working on a project in Poughkeepsie, New York, where Vassar College exists. And it's to transform early learning for kids zero to five. And it's based on the Vassar College nursery school curriculum. And the executive director of the Vassar uh, program has joined, uh, joined me as my partner and she is running day one early learning. But to Jomstead's point, when a kid is zero to five, they are in the phase of their brain development where it is completely uh, reliant on interaction with people and especially adults, where they are read to, played with, interacted with, talked to. A poor kid in the United States goes to school with 30, having heard 30 million words less than a middle class kid. And None of our childcare situations are good. We have 10% in the whole country is considered high quality. If you have a curriculum when a kid, before a kid is five, that is equity based, that is uh, emotional, social emotional learning, we believe we can change the course of human events and that we can break intergenerational poverty. We can create a society that is not so racist. And we can, but it involves the parents and bringing and 
training teachers who can further this curriculum to build empathy, to build their neural networks. And it's, uh, it's all play-based. It's, you know, play to learn, to grow. And um, I'm really heartened to hear that you can build empathy because somebody, a coach once told me, I was complaining about one of my bosses, which I, she was my coach for 16 years. So I just have to say, um, you know, I believe in coaches. She was fantastic. But especially because in those days, women were, didn't really have other mentors. And uh, uh, I'm just, my screen went a little, let's see you. Um, darn it, oh, here. Excuse me for just a sec there, thank you. She told me that I was describing this boss that I had who completely lacked empathy. He could not put himself in anybody else's shoes. And she said, well, he will never be a good leader. To be a good leader, you have to develop empathy. And um, it's different than um, nurturing or sympathy. Empathy is really getting something out of feeling for another person. And just for me personally, uh, the fact that I can find something to like about just about anybody gives me great comfort. I like that. I would much rather be spending my time trying to figure out how to like somebody than how to criticize them. Or, And this is another thing I tell teams of people. Smart, especially smart people like all of you. The first thing we think if an idea is put in front of us is, oh, let's pick it apart. And I got to tell you, that is easy. It is so easy to pick apart anybody's idea. What's hard is to figure out what's good about it. And if you, I would say in my experience, maybe maybe 5% of the people I've worked at with have been able to do that. And you, you can train them by doing it, but if you can train yourself to figure out what to like about an idea or a person, rather than letting your judgmental self jump in with labels, you know, whatever. And, you know, we all have biases. And, you know, I, for a long time, was biased against people who were trying to sell me things. And um, that doesn't help anybody, you know, doesn't, didn't help me. So I had to learn how to learn from them. And um, I'm just telling you, it's a much more worthwhile way to be than to be always looking for what's wrong. People who can find what's wrong are a dime a dozen. Jerry, can you uh, think back to when you were 17? I think most of our students are probably in the 17, 18 range. Um, anybody different from that that, that might be? They look so much older. They might, there might be some who are older, some younger. Um, but they're, they're finishing, they've finished 12th grade and uh, haven't started their official classes yet. This is sort of a warm-up. I'm calling them. Oh, man. You guys. You guys are so fantastic. And um, most haven't been away from home yet. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, the first semester of their first year is going to have to be online, which is, uh, uh, I'm certainly sorry to see that happen because uh, they've all had to be online for the last year and a half, right? And uh, we're all eager to get into a residential mode. But meanwhile, uh, you know, we're making the best of trying to make these online sessions 
more interactive. And um, but put yourself back to that time in your life. Of course, it's a different time. It's a different country, different culture. Our students come from very diverse backgrounds within India, which is an extremely diverse country. And um, just reflect on what were you thinking about your future? That's a wonderful question. And um, I think for me, at that point in time, I, uh, I was very shy and I would uh, not participate in class. My freshman year at Vassar, I, was, I came from public school. So a lot of the people at Vassar went to private school and they came knowing how to make presentations and write and uh, do well. And I had never been away from home. I had never had alcohol. I um, I was lost. I felt like I had nothing to offer. And I, um, I never really felt comfortable that year. And I didn't do very well on my grades. And I did much too much uh, socializing, much too much drinking. And um, and I really had a rough time making that adjustment. And I didn't have anything like you guys had. Drinking age was 18 back then, right? Yep. Yeah. And I didn't have any of the issues you guys have had with COVID. So, you know, all I had was this simple difference of I'm not as good as these people because I didn't go to private school. And then the next year... I wanted to run for office and my, and I did better in my sophomore year. I got myself together, but my grade point average was too low. And we had this Dean whose nickname was the warden. Do you know what a warden is? It's not a nice nickname. It's like, she was so, she was like a jailer, like somebody who locked us up and her name was Dean Druyer. And so. We're not going to have wardens like that outside. <laughs> what? They're not going to have moments like that. No, no, no. They will be wardens, but they're not going to be like that. <laughs> yeah. So I had to go meet Dean Druyer and make a case for why she should let me run with such a low grade point average. She said, you should not be running. You have such a low grade point average. I said, let me tell you this. I need to be engaged. I need to be fully occupied. I need to care about something. And if you let me run, I'll get straight A's. So she let me run, I got straight A's, and I graduated magna cum laude. And, you know, what can I say? It was like she took a bet on me, and that was so validating that I got my courage to be a good student. And so I don't know if that is, applies to anybody, but there are going to be times in your life where you don't hit the ground running. And don't think that's the way you want to end up. There are lots of ways out of that. For me, it was by getting engaged and um, being fully occupied. There, you know, for you, it might be athletics. It might be um, theater. I don't know, but um, we have players in our. I think also, I didn't really know what I wanted to do in life. I had thought early on I would be a doctor, but then I discovered I faint at the sight of blood. That's not so easy to be a doctor. And so I came not knowing what I would be. But, um, you know, I, my liberal arts education was so fantastic. And one thing I'm excited about your program, as I understand it, is your putting engineering into a liberal arts education, which I believe is the smartest thing possible, because the only thing we know about the future is your brain needs to know a whole lot about a whole lot of different things and be able to think in a whole lot of different ways. And that there's no 
then there's going to be no straight line for success. Um, except if you want to be a doctor, I guess, but um, it's just like engineers should have a liberal arts background because they will be able to see design. They'll be able to think from a, you know, taking psychology is really important if you're going to be an engineer. Taking art is really important if you're going to be an engineer, you know, anthropology, sociology, all that. Um, and, you know, the other thing I would just say to you guys is uh, it's kind of an exciting world that you're inheriting. I mean, you could look at it as my generation screwed up everything. And now we're leaving you with a big mess in terms of the climate and education and all this stuff. But when things are really bad, that's when opportunities happen. And your, your brains between now and when you're 30 are at their most fecund. So don't wait around for some older person to opine what's gonna happen. You guys have these flexible brains that can look at stuff freshly because you haven't heard the rules. You haven't done it before. So don't, don't underestimate how exciting some of your crazy ideas could be. You know, my idea of bringing creators to do their best work to Nickelodeon was insane. You know, nobody would have approved that. My idea of including kids in the process was nutty. What a cumbersome thing to do. Hey, it, you know, when I left Nickelodeon, it was worth 10 to $12 billion out of nothing. So don't let anybody smish your ideas. Try them on each other. You know, I, I think if you guys could be a cohort where you have, you know, without professors, just with yourselves, thinking about the world and what the biggest problems are and just, you know, digging in your, your, your brains are on fire. Maybe not quite yet because you haven't been in contact with each other and with Dom said, but um, most people I know who carved out a place for themselves in the world and were successful had that idea in their 20s and they just kept proving it. And that is certainly true of me. And so don't let your brain relax and wait for older people to tell you stuff when you're in your 20s. And you might not get to build what's in your brain in your 20s, but you have to think it. We have a question from Daksha Jha. Um, good evening, everyone. It's a great honor to be talking to you, ma'am. Um, when you spoke about how you, uh, you know, were pretty insane with your ideas about bringing the creators and letting them do what they want. Uh, so it was pretty different from what most people did at that time. And even now, if I say so. So um, did you ever, like, were you ever scared about taking these risks? Uh, not just this one, but all the other risks you have taken in your professional life, as well as in your personal life. Um, so how do you get that confidence and, you know, to break the barrier and try out something that nobody ever has? Um, I'm glad you asked that question because sometimes when I talk, it seems like everything was so darn easy. And we, we had so many flops at Nickelodeon and I felt them. I felt them hard, not for me, but for my team. So I'll give you one example. Turkey TV, we did in 1985. And it was the idea was we would collect comedy clips from all over the world and link them and have this comedy 
o'clock in the afternoon. And I sold it to my boss in the biggest way. And on a holiday weekend, the first episodes of Turkey TV arrived at my house and I put it on and it was so bad that my son, who now was nine, started to sob. And I said, what, Sam? And he said, you will never work in TV again. It was so bad. And so um, I called my team and said, this is so bad. We can't put it on the air on Wednesday. We have to get everybody back in the office. We have to edit it. We have to fix it. We have to figure it out. And that's what happened. Everybody came back. We worked all weekend and people had an allowance to get a toothbrush. That was it. And we, we fixed it so that it wasn't an embarrassment, but it was not good. It was just okay. Um, and then, so I'll just tell you some of the other problematic times and how I dealt with it. Because people owned Nickelodeon, we felt, we felt like we owned it, even though we didn't. We didn't have any shares in the stock. We didn't benefit from the financial success, except we got bonuses and salaries. But we felt like we owned it. So it just was so personal that it was easier to fix things because we were all in it together. But on the other side of that, when I started Oxygen, we were starting a network and we had 19 internet sites in one year. And we were hiring people at an enormous rate. And, you know, it just was an impossible situation. And the night before we went on the air, I called a town hall and I said, you guys, it's going to be a bloodbath. You know, I don't want you to worry. We're going to get ourselves out of this, but we are not going to look good. People are not going to give us good reviews. We are going to be, because we were, because Oprah Winfrey, when she, you, she's your partner, everybody has you under a microscope and it was traumatic. And, um, but the fact that I let everybody know that we were about to get slammed, a lot of executives try to bury their head in the sand. My thing is when you've got trouble, share it, don't bury it. And you learn more from failure than you do from success. So the other thing I would say is we did a lot of post-mortems. Post-mortem is going over what worked about something and what didn't work about it. Um, and then I'll just tell you one thing. My assistant, Ed, was fantastic. And one day I said, to him, we had meetings every six weeks, the whole company. And I believe in that because that's how people feel ownership. And I said, Ed, this was when we were in our worst situation. We had, we had gotten bad reviews. We were, everybody was pointing at us and having a certain amount of serang. People were so happy that we stumbled. I have to say, I, I, I know, um, it wasn't pretty. So I said to Ed, what do people need to know at the town hall? And he said, they need to know what to say when somebody comes up to them at a cocktail party and tells them they're about to lose their job because oxygen is in such trouble. I said, okay, well, I am going to be the nasty neighbor and I, let's, re, let's reenact the cocktail party at the at the town hall and you, you answer, I'm just going to say nasty things to you and you answer to the best of your ability, what to say. And so turns out I never acted in my life, but I am an extremely good cranky neighbor and I can be extremely nasty when I get into that character. And I just was so mean to Ed 
And he answered so bravely and so well. So it became a regular feature of our, we did it for three or four meetings. And uh, what was good about that as a leader to say the nasty stuff that other people were saying made people realize I didn't, I wasn't afraid and I didn't, um, and I, I wasn't protected from knowing what was going on. Does that help answer your question or did I go astray? Um, partially, I think it did, but basically I wanted to know how, yeah. Um, so how did you, how did you uh, have the courage or the confidence to take risks in your life and to do something different from the others? That's what I want. So when, when, um, When I got married, my husband and I both came from middle class, upper middle class families. His was upper, mine was middle. And he, we were both in education and we walked down the aisle. I looked at Kit and said, we are the most downwardly mobile couple in America. So we never had as a goal that we were going to be rich. And it was always about how can we do something that will be helpful for kids. And so I, I was keenly aware of your question. And I felt like if I am, I'm also fiscally conservative. So um, I did not want to jeopardize my family's uh, income or future. So I always had our house ready to sell, it was always ready to put on the market. And I just was always prepared to be fired. And once you're prepared to be fired, it makes you brave. And I, I but I didn't take any risks for myself. I took only risks for my audience. And, um, and but I, but it was always in my head. How can I, how can I do this? I always had plan B, which was sell the house, move to a little rental and have enough money to send my kids to college. That was it. And then um, my, my family was way more important to me than what I was doing. So I always knew I had something to come back to. I always knew that, okay, if I lose my job, I have these guys who I care more about. I'm not going to be, I, I, it was a very good balance for me. And people ask me all the time, how did you live a life of balance? I didn't live a life of balance. It was, uh, you know, I played hard with my kids. I played hard at my work. I, had a joyous life of imbalance, but what was balanced was in my head, I could take risks for Nickelodeon because we kept proving ourselves. Every year we would grow 36%. We would have a 44% profit margin. We, would, we were fiscally conservative as we built ourselves. We built slowly. And when I left Nickelodeon, It was a tremendously tough decision for me, but I felt like I had never taken any chances on myself. And even though I had done really well in my company, they could never see me in a broader role than Nickelodeon. And it was the gem of the company. So they didn't want to ever take my focus off it. And I got recruited, but before I decided to go to Disney, I had a family meeting. We went out to breakfast and I said, you know, I, if I leave Nickelodeon, it will get nasty. They'll lock me out. They'll throw me on the street, especially since I'm going to Disney ABC. And um, my son said, mom, you have so much more to give. You should go for it. And my daughter said, mom, 
I'll be at your office and I'll answer all the calls and I'll help you pack your boxes. And so having that support was everything to me. And um, are now are we getting closer to the right answer? Thank you. I'm going to call upon uh, the next hand, Nandita Bala. Uh, Jerry, Nandita is actually a Vassar student. And oh, Nandita. I took her on as a virtual intern at Sai University as we we're preparing to launch. And she's been helpful with uh, uh, producing uh, uh, content for the website. She taught a writing workshop for uh, students and has done a, a lot of other things. Anandita? Thank you. And yes, I'm, I think, around 15 minutes from where you are right now, Geraldine. I'm in the TAs at Vassar. Oh, and how Julie, fantastic. Yeah, Julie, your um, co-founder at day one was my pre-major advisor, so it's a really small oh, world. Anyway. When, when do you graduate and can you come work for us? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna come work for Sky University. Oh dear, we're gonna be fighting now. Our family is from Chennai, so. <laughs> oh yeah, you're gonna win. Fantastic. What's your question, Anita? So I was really intrigued by your description of storytelling and playing and in especially staying close to the customer and getting feedback from your audience. And I wanted to know um, if you have any more examples or stories of the role of storytelling and playing across disciplines in academia or in the corporate world. Um, well, that's a seven part question. Um, I guess, uh, I'll guess I'll tell you this story. Early on, we wanted to, there, there are ways of getting information that people want to hear. And that's used very frequently in media where researchers come in and tell you that what you're doing is great and, you know, blah, blah, blah. We were interested in finding out what other people were doing wrong. So one of the first things we did was we took ads that were aimed at kids out to a focus group in Connecticut. And we learned a tremendous lesson that day, which was all these ads were bouncy, you know, filled with adjectives and uh claiming to be cool and all this stuff. And the kids were furious. They said, don't tell us what's cool. Don't tell us what's funny, we'll tell you. And so that became a rule at Nickelodeon is, if you want them to think we're funny, be funny. Don't claim we're funny and then you know, put on a little tragedy. You have to be funny, don't say it. Um, but, the multidisciplinary thing, I guess I would say, you know, the fact that I had this broad education at Vassar, which included uh, history, politics, art history, architecture, city planning, um, you know, I, I just had like an appreciation for creative writing. I had an appreciation for all these things. So our goal, if you looked at the early days of Nickelodeon when we had no money, we were introducing opera in our promos. We were introducing different art styles. We were introducing great writing. And it was that interplay of all that stuff that made us a rich environment. Even though in the early days we were running reruns of other people carefully selected, but the environment we created was definitely built in the liberal arts. And, you know, our, I don't know, in business, I would say, I would use an example of my friend, Mark Ordan, who went to Vassar and then went to business school. And when he came out, he worked for a standard investment banking firm and he wasn't interested in doing that 
he was interested in creating something new. So all of his experience enabled him to actually go on the street and look at what was happening in his area of um, uh, Maryland and see what was lacking for the people of Maryland, which was fresh, fresh food, fresh vegetables. And he created this brand called Fresh Fields, which was about bringing fresh vegetables to suburban communities. It subsequently led to Whole Foods, and <clears throat> but he's an, a supremely great businessman, but he was able to have empathy for the people in his community. And then when you watch him running his businesses, he's there with his customers all the time, talking to them, talking to the people. He knows everybody's name in the stores and he's getting constant feedback. So I don't know, that multidisciplinary approach maybe is more apt there. Thank or, you. Yeah. Uh, we're uh, uh, coming close to the end. So we'll have one last question, uh, uh, maybe brief. Uh, and then, Geraldine, you get uh, the final word. Uh, Rishita? Um, Ma'am, uh, I have two questions which resonate with today's topic that was life lessons by you. So the first question is like you were talking about be as disruptive as you can, go totally different from what the trend is. But, uh, you know, it's it's somewhat similar to Dakshada's question that where do you get that courage from? But my question is, like, how do you fa fight from your family? Like, being in India and that too being a daughter, it's very natural for our parents to, you know, they want me to do something which is tried and tested. To go this way, okay, you do your graduation, then you go for your post-graduation, and then you apply for a, for a job, for an MNC. But you know it's should i be like no this is what i've decided upon and this is what i'm going to do because this is something which i do <laughs> since my childhood i listen to everybody but i do what my head says and b my question is like i was really intrigued the way you were talking about the relationship you share with your husband like it was like the love is as fresh as it was decades ago so how do you balance your personal life and your professional life like how to maintain and strike that perfect balance well i you know i was uh, incredibly fortunate to have it was like a family business so my poor kids were part of everything. And now they're both writers. Con Sam writes for uh, network television and Emmy's written young adult novels and she's now producing it for television. So um, it was a family business and everybody was involved in it. And my husband produced a couple shows for Nickelodeon, um, but you know, he was producing for other people too. But um, I really feel like, I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't met him. I probably would have gone and been an architect and had a different, completely different life. But when you find somebody who is, you know, and I don't even know whether you get to choose who you marry. I don't know whether that's part of your family or whether they get chosen for you. So my advice may be totally irrelevant, but I just, my husband was different from anybody I had dated. He was playful, creative, exciting to be with. And, you know, that we built this together. And uh, that's a rare opportunity. But I think you can find that same thing in people you work with. 
And I think in terms of your parents, I would just sit down with them and tell them how much you love them and how you don't want to upset them. But here's your thinking and could they help you um, on that path? And, uh, you know, but I don't pretend to know your parents or your culture. And, you know, my parents were tremendously supportive of my career. They moved to our property. They were, so my kids always had grandparents and parents and they didn't feel deprived. But, um, you know, I would just say, try to, don't, don't get into a headbutt with them. Bring them along slowly and show them what you're excited about and see if you can get them to play with you. That's a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Geraldine Laybourne. And uh, we will call upon you again and again in different kinds of formats to help. Next year in person. Next year in person, definitely. You, you give us the, uh, you say when, and we'll send you the plane ticket, and uh, um, that will be absolutely wonderful. Thank you for this treat, everybody. I just can't tell you how exciting it is. I love India. I miss it so much. I've been many times, and thank you for bringing me some wonderful memories. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.